Did you commit to another CPA review course that just isn't aligned with how you learn? Well, spilled milk, baby. In the world of accounting, only one figure matters, and that's the bottom line. So by investing in universal CPA review, you're investing in yourself, and we promise to do everything in our power to get you the ROI that you're looking for by obtaining your CPA license. We know that purchasing a CPA review course is an investment, and we also know that spending all that money on a program that hasn't worked out sucks, and we want to soften that blow. Our Spilled Milk program will allow you to commit to Universal's Visual Learning CPA Review program at a steep discount. So reach out to info at universalcpareview.com to learn more about our program and what discounts you qualify for. Okay, so we talked about short-term liabilities. Now we're going to introduce you to long-term liabilities. And then we're going to talk about the concept of the time value of money. Right At the end of the day, the FAR exam has two primary questions that we need to address. How is something getting classified, aka where in the financial statements is this getting reported? And what is the value, aka what is the number that is getting presented in that financial statement? So previously we talked about the classification portion of these accounts in our balance sheet lecture. And we discussed what is getting reported as a long-term liability. So just as a reminder, this will consist of things like notes payable, bonds, deferred tax liabilities, accumulated depreciation, things of that nature. This will consist of any liability or obligation that will have a timeline of 12 months or greater. Okay, so that is going to relate to the balance sheet, but we're also going to have some income statement impacts related to long-term liabilities as well. So what income statement impacts might we see here? How about interest, right? Interest revenue and interest expense is generally associated with long-term liabilities. Okay, so this is how the creditor or the lender is going to profit. We're selling cash after all. But as you know, the FAR exam wants you to dissect each of these classified liabilities and calculate how we get to each of these numbers. So if you see $3,482,912 on the balance sheet, and that associated liability has $9,230 in interest on the income statement, we want to know how these numbers were calculated. So we have all these long-term liabilities that we're going to touch on. But for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to fire up our long-term liabilities discussion with the notes payable. So we talked about notes receivable when we were previously dissecting our assets, but now we're dissecting those liabilities. So we're shifting over to notes payable. So as we remember, Notes payable can either be short-term or long-term. And yes, it's not a terrible idea to associate these with long-term liabilities because generally notes will be associated with interest rates and interest is generally going to be paid on obligations that are longer than one year. But technically, notes payable can also be short-term. Okay, so super important that we pay attention to the dates. So what do we need to remember when it comes to identifying short-term versus long-term notes payable? So what you need to remember is that short-term notes payable need to be reported at their face value, whereas long-term notes payable will be recorded at their present value. So what's the difference between the two? So the face value is going to be the total dollar value stated by the issuer. All right, so when you're thinking face value, you're thinking about the interest payments, right? At the end of the day, the total interest payments will amount to the total payment value of the liability whereas the present value is going to be more so related to the total interest expense associated with the liability. Okay, so this is going to also be considered the carrying value. So when you're thinking about the long-term notes payable, you need to think that this is going to be recorded at present value. So we're going to learn when we get into our bonds lecture that this is no different, right? Because when we have a long-term liability, we're always going to have a face value, right? This is the cash payment value but that's not always the same amount as what's getting recorded as an expense on the income statement. So if we have this discrepancy between the face value and the present value, then we'll generally have what's called a discount on the note. So bonds, notes payable, very similar stuff. Okay, so if you get into bonds and this starts to make more sense, think about notes payable as something very similar. All right, so... You might be wondering what's the difference between a note payable and a bond if they're essentially the same thing. Well, the primary difference is that bonds are more so associated with securities, right? They're regulated as securities and notes payable are not. 
So bonds are specific securities, whereas notes payable can be a lot of different types of debt agreements. Okay, but at the end of the day, very similar when it comes to understanding this for CPA exam purposes. So as we mentioned, when we have notes payable, we're generally going to have interest associated with the note. So now we're going to discuss the two primary rates that we need to focus on when it comes to notes payable. So don't let big words spook you. Let's instead focus on the meaning, right? Let's focus on the intuition and the why, and this is going to seem a lot more digestible. Okay, so the two rates that we need to focus on consist of the stated rate and the imputed rate. All right, at the end of the day, this is a glorified version of what we're gonna talk about when we get into bonds. But at the end of the day, what is the point of interest rates, people? Interest rates represent the profit on the loan. So the name of the game here is trying to determine whether or not this is a reasonable loan, right? Does it seem legit or are we just giving our family a zero interest bearing loan and telling them, no, it's all good, just pay me back in cash. No interest necessary, right? So again, we have the face value and the present value. And the face value is the total cash payment. So when you're thinking about the stated interest rate, you're thinking about the face value, right? This is the cash going out the door or the cash coming in. So if a note is issued for the amount of cash that is being loaned, then the interest earned that is going to be reported is going to be the same as the interest stated, AKA the interest paid. So if the loan is made at an arm's length, then it is assumed to be a fair loan. But what if we don't think the rates seem fair, right? What if dad gives son some money and says, hey son, I'm gonna loan you some money. And the son says, gee, this all sounds great, dad, but are you sure this is a good deal for me? Don't I have to pay a little something called interest? And dad's like, oh crap, he caught me. But then he says, no, 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 no interest necessary. Well, then maybe this is not going to be presumed to be fair, in which case the imputed interest rate will need to be used. Okay, that sounds like a big word, but it doesn't need to. The imputed interest rate is the estimated interest rate on debt. So essentially, we're going to be estimating a market rate that will ultimately seem more reasonable associated with this particular debt. So when two parties enter into this business transaction and a note is issued from one party to the other, the default assumption is that the interest rate associated with this note is going to be very close to the market rate. Okay, but there are a couple of situations that can exist that might indicate otherwise. There are situations when no interest rate is stated. This is sometimes considered a non-interest bearing note. And there are other times when the stated rate is considered significantly different from the market rate, right? Thinking back on dad loaning son some money. If the interest rate he gives him is like 1%, or maybe there's no interest at all, and the assumed market rate is something significantly higher, like eight or 9%, well, this is going to be considered unreasonably low. So what are we going to do with the stated rate if the market rate has this huge discrepancy? Well, then we're going to have to record this transaction using an interest rate that is much more closely depicting the market rate. Okay, so the rate that should be used is going to be a rate that is approximately similar to a rate that would have been used had this been an independent borrower and a lender entering into a similar arrangement. Okay, but what are some reasons why the imputed interest rate would not be required? Okay, in which event the present value would not be determined. So imputing interest is not going to be required on certain payables, even if they have no interest at all or a very low interest rate, if this is in the ordinary course of business and the terms of the agreement are one year or less, or the note is paid on property or services, AKA not cash. Okay, so super sneaky to be on the lookout for. If we are reading through a question, we need to be aware of certain buzzwords. Okay, so if you're scanning through a question, you're reading, you're reading, and you see, boom, this was made under customary trade terms, or alternatively, they could say ordinary trade terms, usual trade terms, and they do not exceed one year, then this note is going to be issued at face value. Okay, so again, sneaky, sneaky, gotta be on the lookout for that. Okay, so just to recap, the total payments will equal the face value. You can also think of this as the gross value, whereas the present value, which will ultimately determine the total interest expense, might result in this discrepancy. Okay, so the discrepancy is what is considered our discount.
Okay, and something we're going to talk about a little bit more when we get into bonds is this discount is going to be amortized. So if you think back on trade receivables, this discount is very similar to what we talked about when we discussed the allowance for doubtful accounts. Right, the net receivable plus that allowance account gave us the gross receivable. Very similar to adding the present value to the discount, right? That'll ultimately equate to the face value or the gross value. Okay, so this is also going to be separate and will be considered a contra account on the balance sheet. Okay, so as we mentioned previously, if the imputed interest rate is going to be used, which will occur when there is no interest rate provided to the borrower, or if the stated rate is significantly lower than the typical rate, which would be reflected as the market rate, then we're going to end up using this imputed interest rate. And that means that the beginning value of the note payable will be presented on the balance sheet at its present value. Okay, so we remember that the present value is now going to be less than the face value, which means that the difference would result in a discount. And the whole idea is that the bond is issued at a price that is less than the face value. So what the exam might do is ask you to calculate the periodic interest expense. But what also needs to be understood is that this discount is going to be amortized, which will result in a periodic amortization expense. And all of this is going to be done by applying what's referred to as the effective interest method. Okay, so the effective interest method is a topic that we're going to dive into in way more detail when we get into bonds. But this is something that we're going to cover now at a high level because it will also apply to notes payable. Okay, so as we mentioned, notes payable are going to be very similar to bonds conceptually. So it only makes sense that these calculations are going to be the same. So we're going to run through this step-by-step -step process for determining the interest expense when applying the effective interest method. Okay, so we also need to understand how to amortize the discount, which will impact the end of the period note payable that is getting presented on the balance sheet. So again, if we run through this and you're still feeling rather confused, don't worry too much because we're going to really drive this home when we get into the bonds module. So we have five steps to our effective interest method. Step one is going to be determining the present value of the notes payable. Okay, so again, this is if we are applying the imputed rate. And we can do this by applying the present value factors that are provided, or they might just tell you what the present value is. But regardless, this is the beginning carrying value, right? This is the amount that is presented on the balance sheet as the note payable on day one. So step two is going to be determining the interest expense. But keep in mind, this can also be interest income, depending on which side of the lending agreement it is that we're talking about. Okay, so for simplicity, let's say for now that this is cash that is being paid back on the note. So this would be interest expense. Okay, so as we mentioned, notes are going to incur interest. And that interest is going to be incurred regardless of whether or not cash is paid. So it's going to be reported on the income statement every single period, no matter what. All right, an interest expense is going to be calculated by taking the beginning and present value, right, our carrying value, and multiplying it by the market rate, which is the whole idea of using this imputed rate, right? We're doing this to determine our market rate. We want to estimate what a normal rate would actually look like on the open market. Okay, so again, this is the interest expense for each period that is going straight to the income statement. And this is different from step three, which will be determining our interest payment. The interest payment is not the interest expense that is getting reflected on the income statement. Instead, this is reflecting the cash that is going out the door. So we're going to take the face value and we're going to multiply it by the stated rate. So as we remember, the present value will be less than the face value when we have a discount. So this is why we need to amortize this by applying the effective interest method, right? So now we can calculate the amortization expense. And we're going to do this by simply taking the difference between step two and step three, the interest expense and the interest payment. And the amortization expense will be for the period on the discount. And the ultimate idea here is that we're bringing this lower present value up towards the face value. So every time a period goes by and this discount is amortized, the note payable that is presented on the balance sheet will actually increase until it has reached that face value amount. So at the end of the day, this is the step-by-step -step for applying the effective interest method. But like we said, this is going to be drilled into much more detail when we get into bonds. But again, just another gentle reminder as to why notes payable and bonds are very, very similar. Okay, so let's record some journal entries related to these notes payable. Okay, so taking a look at an example here, Willie Corp issues a $5 million note payable for the purchase of its equipment. 
Remember, notes are going to be different from bonds in that bonds are generally associated with securities. Notes payable will generally be associated with the purchase of something alternative like equipment or machinery. Okay, so the note had a stated interest rate of 5%, where similar issuances are being purchased by investors at 8% interest. So the note pays interest annually, and it is to be redeemed in six years. So by telling us that similar issuances are being made by investors at 8% interest, whereas our stated interest rate is 5%, we now know that this is issued at a discount. Right? We're basically saying that this note is being issued at a rate that is much less than what is yielded in the open market. All right, so we know we're going to use the present value. So step one is determining our present value amount. So we can do this by taking our present value factors. Okay, so we're gonna dive into this more in detail in the next module, but note for now that the present value factors will be the sum of the present value for the interest payments and the present value of the principal. Okay, so the present value is going to be the sum of these two amounts, which will be 4,306,570. So now that we know our present value, we can determine what our discount is. So the difference between the face value and the present value gives us a discount. And now we can record the initial issuance of the note payable. We're going to debit the equipment, right? This is the amount that it is going to be recorded for on our books for 4,306,570. And we purchase this via a note. Okay, so the note payable is what is credited for 5 million. All right, so now backing into the discount is going to be the difference between the two. So the discount on the note payable would be 693,430. So only natural that this is going to be debited. Okay, so that's the initial issuance for the note. But now recording the annual interest expense, we're going to have to think back on the effective interest method that we previously talked about. So for calculating that year one annual interest expense, we need to pull out our five steps. Step one was determining the present value. Okay, we already did that. It's 4,306,570. Step two is determining the interest expense. And we're going to do this by multiplying this 4,306,570 by the market rate. So the market rate is 8%. So that gives us an interest expense of 344,526. Okay, so we're debiting interest expense for 344,526 and we're crediting the discount on the notes payable. All right, so if they asked us to determine the amount that is getting reflected on the balance sheet at the end of this first period, we would need to first amortize the discount. In order to do that, we need to determine step three, which is our interest payment. Simply just the stated rate times the $5 million face value amount. Okay, so that's $250,000. And now in step four, when determining the amortization expense, we're just going to take the difference between the two. Okay, so that's 94,526. So now we can determine the note payable that is reflected on the balance sheet at the end of the period. And we know that we're going to be adding this to the beginning carrying value, right? The beginning present value. And the reason is because we're going to be working our way back up towards the face value. Okay, so the amount reflected would be the beginning present value, right? The 4306570 plus the amortization expense amount of 94526 So therefore, the balance sheet amount reflected at the end of the period for the note payable would be $4,401,096.